Hey everybody, welcome to my channel, Northwest Small Batch Brewing. I'm Steven, and a little different view today. Uh, today's video is going to be about uh, where I'm at, and what I'm doing, and what's going on here. Uh, so let's say you take a look around my channel. I've got about 50 videos on it now, all about home brewing, cider, beer, different kinds of uh, experiments. I like to try out different theories I have, uh, all about, you know, brewing and fermenting. Uh, so if you like what you see, it would help me out a lot if you hit the like button, the thumbs up, and while you're there, hit the subscribe button, and that way you can get notified every time I put out a new video. And, you know, it helps the channel. So let's get to the video. Uh, well, let's see, what can I say? I really originally wanted to talk about equipment. Um, because I finally pulled the trigger and bought a new brewing system on this side of me here. Uh, this is my old system here. Um, so I guess to start with, I wanted to say that you will find that most people with home brewing channels on YouTube have some kind of brewing system. And it can be a little bit overwhelming if you're just getting into the craft or you're interested in learning how to brew beer and you're finding these channels on brewing beer and everybody has all this equipment and fancy stuff that you don't have and when you start looking into it you realize it's pretty expensive uh, to try to get all that kind of stuff. So the first thing I wanted to point out was you don't need it. Uh, I didn't start off with all this equipment. Uh, I started off years ago with a pot on the stove, a fermenter, an airlock, and a siphon. And then, of course, you need a way to bottle your beer. So bottles and uh, bottle caps and a bottle capper. But, uh, so, I mean, that's all you really need to make beer. Everything else is sort of like gravy, meaning it's like it either makes your brew day faster, it allows you maybe to brew more beer than you could do on your stove easily, uh, or it just makes it easier to dial in your process and make a maybe a slightly better beer and and as you start learning more and more about brewing and uh, all the sort of sciencey nerdy parts of it uh, you start to be able to dial that in with different equipment and you don't have to buy everything all at once so you start off with the basics make your beer on the stove if you like it and you start to get hooked Maybe the next thing you buy is, I don't know, a, a second fermenter or whatever. You just slowly start building up and um, eventually, if, if you're really into it, you'll start uh, saving up and saving up and, and getting, you know, different pieces of equipment slowly. But I, I would doubt that anybody who's uh, doing brewing with these kinds of equipment bought it all at once. It was all piecemealed as they were able to buy it. So... Here's where I'm at, then my old system right here, the mash and boil. I've already um, made a video on a, um, basically a review of how I feel about it. Uh, it has some good sides, um, especially the cost. For uh, It is really the least expensive all-in-one sort of system, but it has a lot of cons I'm not going to go into because you can look at the video that I will link up here in the corner um, that will um, tell you all my thoughts about it. Uh, I will say this because I had just got this system today in the mail and I looked this up. So if you look at the other video that I just linked, you'll note that one of my biggest complaints about this system, this mash and boil, is that the, um, the, the malt pipe here, so this is in place of having a bag, you have this malt pipe. It's solid metal, right? So you don't get very good efficiency because the water can't really flow through it very well. Well, this company here came out with a version 2.0. So, uh, and it fixed a lot of the problems that I had with this system. So I, I contacted them and I said, can I buy that, um, the, malt, the malt pipe separately? And they said, no, you have to buy the whole new brand, brand new system. We're not selling that separately at this point. They said at some point we may send it, sell it through our uh, designated uh, I don't know what they call it, vendor, uh, they have like, a, it's called Williams Brewing. By the way, I'm not impressed with them either. I'll explain that in a second. So I found uh, today, they actually finally started selling that malt pipe uh, separately on the Williams website. 
uh, it's basically got perforation, perforations about a third of the way up. That's the main difference. And it has the legs on it that I already swapped out uh, myself on this one. This malt pipe that I have, the old one, you can buy a replacement on that site for like $35. The new pipe, by the way, that really is nothing different but some extra holes in it and different feet, it's like $90, 90 American dollars. Way overpriced, it's ridiculous. Not only that, this Williams Brewing website, um, they only do free shipping on orders of $99.99, so basically $100 or more. And if you look at any other brewing site, Northern Brewer, More Beer, all these other sites, I mean, I want to say it's somewhere around $65 that you have to spend to get free shipping. $100 for free shipping is a ripoff and too much. Um, it's just too much. So the thing is, the shipping is basically like $9. I think it was like $8.99 to ship that malt pipe. So you end up spending $100 anyway, and you still don't get the free shipping. $100, not worth it for that malt pipe. Just rip off. Anyway, this system will either be um, gifted to somebody else, or uh, I may be using it as a hot liquor tank to hold my sparge water. Um, the reason I say maybe is because this new brewing system here by Clawhammer, uh, from everything I've seen, most people say you don't need to sparge. It has such good efficiency, you don't even need to bother sparging. So I will test that out myself. And if that is the case, um, I guess then I will be finding a new home for this guy because I just don't have space for storing so much stuff. Or maybe, I guess I could keep it as a backup uh, system or something, but anyway. So I'm gonna move this just slightly so it's just like not right in my way of everything. So I'm not going to really go through everything about the claw hammer system here, um, except to say that I am still in the process of putting it together. Uh, and I'll do a review of it, you know, probably like in six months or eight months or something when I'm, you know, when I have, so, have some time under my belt with it. But um, it's a modular system, meaning every part on it can be swapped out and replaced. And at some point I'm thinking about uh, maybe getting the 240 volt. Uh, box and element and then I can heat it basically lets you heat up your wort and uh, boil significantly faster um, so that might be something I end up doing but in the ta for the time being it's a 110 system um, I'm not going to go into the details of it right now because there's lots of videos out there on this system this is a ubiquitous system you'll find most uh, YouTube uh, homebrew channels are using this system. Not all of them. I have to say there are quite a few that don't. But if you like put them all together, I think this is the system that most have. Uh, and I think it's because it is the most cost-effective system. It does let you switch out parts individually if they fail or you want to upgrade them or you want a different pump that came, than what came with it. All that kind of stuff. It's so easy to just get new ones. Um, and from what I can tell, it has a cool sprayer system. The only thing I want to say about this real quickly here before I move on is uh, as I was putting it together, uh, two things. Number one, it was packed really well, but one of the screws that holds the ground for the cable, the power cable, um, I just found it like randomly in a bag, like sitting in the box, like it had fallen out. So that's not good because I didn't know what it went to and if I hadn't found it, I wouldn't have had that screw for the ground. So that was a little frustrating. Um, also, uh, I guess two more things about, about it that I can t tell you right away as far as putting it together. None of it comes together, by the way. It kind of makes sense because it's a modular system and it's been, and it's built for you to be able to replace the swap parts out. But it would be kind of nice if it came put together. Uh, but that being said, um, the spray nozzle that goes on top here, I put it on and it was so loose I couldn't get it tightened down. Turns out uh, you have to be really careful with the Teflon tape. So I unscrewed it and I had to basically take off the tape and just put a single layer of Teflon tape. Uh, and then I was able to get it pretty tight on there. So um, secret to that, if you're ever buying one of these is for the sprayer on top, uh, be very, very conservative with the Teflon tape that you put on it. There was something else I was going to mention about this. Um, maybe not. 
No, I was going to say something else about it. Um, I can't think of it right. Oh, I guess it was that. Um, so you can't see it, but on this side where the plug goes in, like the element, um, it's it's held in with a tri clamp and a um, uh, silicone um, washer or whatever you want to call it. Um, so the thing is, they don't tell you on their video how to put it together. Now they may probably think it's really obvious, but if you're somebody like me who's never had a system that uses a tri clamp, I didn't realize that I, I was like, do I need the gasket? Do I not need the gasket? Well, I can see by the way it's shaped and everything that I do. I do wish that they had a spare. So I'm going to check their website because um, eventually I'm going to get a neoprene. They also sell this neoprene jacket that goes around it when you're mashing to help keep the temperature uh, even. But um, the weird thing is they give you a spare metal washer, which uh, I don't know why they gave you this. Uh, I would have much rather had a spare gasket so that the gasket, um, you know, for the element disappears or, or breaks down. So I'm going to see if they have a spare one on their website and just buy one as a backup just to have around. Also, they have these um, hose clamps. You can get these anywhere, so that's not too bad. And I even have some probably for my kegging system that I could use. Um, I haven't cut the, the, the tube. That's the other thing I guess I should say, and I'm, I'm, this is way more than I was going to talk about of this system, but this, is, this came kind of gets me by a surprise. This is the tubing that it comes with that uh, you use for the pump and everything else. What took me by a surprise is when you see it like on, online on YouTube channels and on the Clawhammer channel, it looks much like thicker and wider than it actually is. This is actually much thinner tubing than I thought it was going to be. But I'm sure it'll be fine because I'm sure this is what comes with the system for everybody. All right. So what's in the future? Um, well, I'm going to show you something in a second because uh, I got one more thing. Uh, I went on a shopping spree. No, it was tax time. I had a little extra money and um, this was something I had been wanting to do for a while. Um, so I'm going to be doing... Uh, as, I, as I talked about earlier, as far as the equipment goes and that you don't need all this equipment for making beer, I am going to be making a video. Um, I don't know when I'll be able to air it. It might be a few months, but um, I will be airing a video on like one of the easiest possible beers you can make with a minimal amount of equipment and the least amount of cost. Um, so that will be coming up. It'll be one gallon batch for people who are just getting into brewing and just want to know how can I make beer for the first time without having to invest a fortune into it just in case I don't end up liking you know the hobby. So I'll do a video on that so if you're interested in that hit subscribe so that you can get notified uh, when I put that video out. In addition I will probably at the same time I'll probably do a double batch of beer. I'll do one gallon of that and then I'll, and I'll split it and put another gallon into another jug and I'm going to do a little experiment. I want to show you the difference between using or making a beer with uh, regular, say, ale yeast and using uh, bread yeast. So you can see, does it taste different? How does it look? Does it, you know, all that stuff, right? Um, because yes, you can make beer with bread yeast. Uh, so we're going to do that. So we can have that little experiment to show you. So stay tuned for that. And again, subscribe if you want to get notified when I put that video out. And um, the next, well, I've got lots of beers coming up, but I think I can say that I won't have made this by the time I post this video. Uh, I will be doing a Kolsch. I'm not going to tell you what kind of Kolsch, uh, but I'm going to be doing a, a Kolsch with a twist. And if you're not familiar, a Kolsch is basically a German beer that's almost like a lager, but it's made with ale yeast and then it's fermented at a very cold temperature. Well, I say very cold, say 60, 60 to 65 degrees. And then um, you just get a very, in, a very distinct flavor of beer with that. And uh, I think it's going to be really good. So uh, if you're interested in that, now you may be asking, but how can I make a Kolsch? if I don't have a way to maintain my fermentation temperature. Aha, uh -huh. that is the second little surprise. Uh, so let me see if I can get up and move the camera. I'm kind of wired in here um, for sound, but I'm gonna try and do this. 
So I'm hoping that I have this pointed right. Um, I'm actually holding the camera, which I shouldn't do. I got a little chest freezer, so hopefully you can see it. Uh, I didn't have anywhere else to put it. It's not the best place to put it. Uh, it's right behind where I normally do my um, little videos for this channel. But um, it'll work. And uh, I did want to point something out while I'm here. If you're ever thinking about getting one of these, this is a five cubic uh, cubic foot. Um, if you're in the U.S., that's what they call it. Uh, freezer. It's pretty small, but they do make smaller ones. So this is the five cubic one. Uh, they're going to run you currently, like uh, I mean, it depends where you get them. You can get real cheap ones at Walmart for like two hundred dollars or something like that. This one was probably around three hundred or something like that. But um, still, that's not that expensive for a chest freezer. This is not like some super expensive Primo. But the thing to take note. When you open it, I'm going to move the camera, so I apologize if it's like wobbly. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. So I hope you can see that, but basically there's a lip in there or, or a step. So it's important to, to realize that they all kind of come like that. So that means that you have to consider that will your fermenter fit in that section down there and how much headspace will it have? Like if you have a spunding valve or something. I did check and my um, anvil fermenter fits perfectly. Uh, okay. okay, so I don't know. This is probably all, my camera's probably all sideways in cattywampus at this point. But there you have it. A freezer. How's that going to work? I am uh, I got a controller. It's called a PID controller. I think I got the Inkbird version, which is what everyone recommends. They're not very expensive at all. Uh, you plug the free freezer into this controller and then the, the controller has a th sort of a thermostat on it, that uh, like a probe, kind of like you know an oven probe. So what you do is you tape the probe to your fermenter, and then you put something over that to sort of insulate it. I saved some of the um, foam packaging that came with some of this stuff, and I'm going to use that to just sort of tape over the probe. And then it will, uh, you know, if you have a thermo well that goes right into your your uh, fermenter. That'll work even better. I am not willing to drill and put a thermo well into my um, pressurized fermenter because I have read stories from a lot of people where it's not holding pressure after they do that. So I don't want to take that chance. So I'm just going to tape it to the side of the fermenter and insulate it. And I think that'll be good enough. That way it'll read the temperature for the most part of the, um, the, the liquid and not like the ambient temperature. Anyway, the point is this controller will read that temperature and then it will turn the freezer on and off um, as it needs to to maintain the temperature that you set it to. And that's how you can do, um, you can log your beers that way because it's controlled. Uh, or in this case, I'm going to do a Kolsch. The re reason I really got it is because I don't have air conditioning. So um, like last year, we had, we had quite a while where we had over 100 degrees. Um, it's getting hotter and hotter. Uh, it never used to get that hot, but it is what it is. And if I want to brew beer over the summer, I really needed a way to control the temperature for the fermenter because um, I had a lot of beers I made over the summer last year were not good because of the, the heat. So I really needed to do that. So that being said, uh, I think that's all I have for updates. So, that's a lot to digest. I will see you in a week. Uh, I'm not sure yet what I'll be posting, uh, but it'll be something good. Always is. So, until next time, I hope that you are brewing something good. I hope that you are starting home brewing, thinking about home brewing, or just um, maybe you're just finding it interesting to watch videos about how it all works and how the equipment works and stuff like that. So glad you're here. Stick around and come back in a week. And until next time, keep on brewing. Bye-bye.